Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it brings to me to be the last presentation of the of the session, and that means I'm between you and the bar, which is actually worse than the present before between you and Notch. Uh, I'm going to try and make this reasonably short. I feel a complete fraud here, in as much as most of you people are researchers, you're doing innovative and new research. I'm an industrial person. My job as chief architect at ARM is really to take a lot of the research ideas and help deploy them into industry, to help deploy them into chips, into processors, because at the end of the day, this is about security, and security is about securing the world's computing devices. I think there is a real problem, and it's getting worse fast. Um, and what I wanted to do here is really think through what are the deployment challenges of, um, of bringing security to market. There was a really good question in Simon's presentation about what does industrial deployment mean or words to that effect. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I wasn't entirely prepared to, but it seemed too good a link to miss uh, the opportunity of. And I'm also going, given that at least two people have gone, how was that Spectre thing? How, how was that for you? Um, because I've been asked that a couple of times, I've got a few slides on um, Spectre and what I think it means, because I think it's actually a real game changer uh, to the um, the way computing has been abstracted for quite a number of years. So I'm Richard Christensweight, Chief Architect. My, I've been looking after the ARM architecture for the best part of 20 years at ARM. Somebody earlier was talking, the first speaker was talking about ARM Trust Zone. I was heavily involved in the original generation of that, and I think he said something like, it's getting a bit old, I'll be the first to admit that. But then again, I'm getting a bit old. Um, I'm assuming everyone knows who ARM is. Um, I used to have to give this presentation or presentations like this, and people go, who's that arm thing? People seem to have discovered us these days. We are the world's leading semiconductor IP company. We're also three miles away, which means turning down an excuse, uh, turning down a, an invitation to talk is kind of weak. Um, founded in 1990, 125 billion arm chips have been shipped in that period of time. Um, it makes us actually a, you know, the most successful, the most widely deployed 32-bit uh, architecture and 64-bit architecture in the world, 1,400 licenses over 460 companies in every, virtually every um, electronic product around, obviously known for the smart, as being the processor at the heart of the smartphone, but you can get laptops now based around ARM. Um, there are supercomputers being built around ARM. There's an awful lot of very small IoT devices based around ARM, We're kind of everywhere. And we were, we've been historically known um, as an energy efficiency company, but we're increasingly seeing security as being one of the big themes that matters. Everything needs to be secure as we move into this digital world where all of your data, all of your life is being held in the digital world, then the security of that becomes absolutely paramount to everything that we do. And if we're everywhere, then it kind of means that we have to care an awful lot about security. And my role as uh, Chief Architect is to manage the way that our architecture deploys new technologies. And what I'm going to talk about here really is about how we are putting in features to aid the security uh, into the ARM architecture and what it takes to actually deploy those in the real world. Uh, and just to give a little bit of background, ARM version 8 is our latest version of the architecture. It's the thing that's in pretty much everyone's phone, if you bought a phone in the last three or four years. Um, we have two fundamental business models. We, we make uh, RTL level designs, so that's basically the hardware description language of it, and sell that to lots of people. But we also, for a small number of licensees, we actually license the architecture and say to people, go build it from a clean sheet. You can go and build a processor that is compliant with that. And the big part of managing the architecture is managing that relationship with some of the biggest companies in the world and, and household names that I won't name here, but if you know anything about us, you'll know the sort of companies we're talking about. What we do in order to manage the architecture is we run an annual process where we say we're going to put in new features every year on an annual tick. And it's, a, it's a moving train. It's called the RV.8.X point, point program. Uh, it started in 2014, this year, 2018, we're doing ARMv8.5. Um, and it's designed to bring in small-scale, incrementally deployable features at a managed pace, so people can see this coming in. 
And what the reason we did this is that if you actually look at Intel, every process that they do, they add new instructions and so on. And we have to be able to cope with that. Plus, as we go into wider markets and, and bigger markets, so we need uh, to adapt to the needs of those markets. Uh, the exact pace at which architecture partners adopt them, you get them in your end devices, is um, kind of determined by the partner's pace. But typically, it's worth observing that if I say we should have this new instruction, the earliest you will ever see it is four years later. It takes that long between baking in an instruction and actually getting it into, say, a cell phone that you can buy in Best Buy or or mobile phone warehouse or wherever these days. And that, that time lag comes from the, the time it takes to build the chips, the time it takes to, um, um, well, the time it takes to actually just do the processor design, the time it takes to integrate that into the SOC, the time it takes for the SOC to be qualified, and that's probably got at least one spin of the silicon, plus you've got to build the phones, plus they've got to be announced, and so on and so forth. Four years. And anyone who's done control theory will realize that if your feedback, because the software guys actually start using it four years later, because that's where they got the silicon in their hands. And it's very nice. Simon and Robert have done fantastic work with Cherry, proving prototype silicon working on their system. But that's prototype silicon. And if you try and take that to um, an Android or, or whatever, then actually they only restart working it when they've got silicon, because it takes so much work to, you need all of the system there. And so, if it takes four to five years before they've actually worked out what works, you think that that's your feedback loop. You get all sorts of odd effects, and the loop can actually be unstable. Because if, if after three years you go, you know what, that feature wasn't a good idea, you take it out and all of a sudden it gets used, you're going to oscillate. Which is why I tend to say an architecture feature is for life, not just for Christmas. Um, but what was really interesting about the RB of Windex program is Increasingly, we've observed security features are, a new, are one of the major so, uh, new sources of features. Um, as we go on, in fact, every single one of the 8.x editions, there's been something there with a security bent on it. And this really is a very interesting reflection. It reflects quite a lot of what's going on in the industry. To give some examples of those things, the original um, ARM V8 uh, had hardware support for AES and for SHA up to SHA-256. People largely at that point thinking SHA-512 is never going to be widely used. Uh, in a couple of years ago, SHA-3 came along and all of our hardware support for cryptography was a very Western world focused thing. About a quarter of the world's population is in China and they want cryptography too, and the Chinese want their own cryptography. So actually hardware support for SM3 and SM4, SM3 is, I always get these the way around, SM3 is the Chinese equivalent of SHA, SM4 is the Chinese equivalent of AES. They're similar but different, you can accelerate them in hardware in very similar ways. There was talk earlier about ARM's pointer authentication to, repair, uh, to protect against return-oriented programming. Uh, we added that two or three years ago, you can't yet get chips with that deployed, because we're still in that four-year deployment time. But the idea behind this is we use the fact that nobody ever needs 64 bits of pointer. It's one of those phrases that will come back to haunt us in the future, but at the moment, <laughs> there's plenty of space at the top of the pointer. So can we, can what we do when we save, um, when you go into a function, typically you save the return address of the function on the stack, and at the end of the um, function, you take it off the stack. If you actually put an authentication code, cryptographically generated, um, at the top of that function, and then check it when you come out again, then it means that something like return onto programming, which is all about branching into the middle of a function, um, it wouldn't have the correct authentication code uh, to do the return, and therefore it's much harder to uh, put these things together. Relatively simple, you can actually deploy this in ways that fits into no op space and existing codes, so you have libraries that are ready to deploy this when it's ready. As an architect, one of the interesting principles, and when I come on to talk about Spectre, I'll, um, I will demonstrate that this um, doesn't really apply anymore. But as an architect, what we tend to say 
is this is the architecture. This tells you what the processor is meant to do it, how the pro what the processor is meant to do, how the processor does it. That's your business. Microarchitects, go off and invent the cleverest ways you can to go and do it. It shouldn't matter. And one of the rules there is we don't bother normally saying how long an ad instruction take or whatever. And one of the problems became very clear is because we had no rules about um, which instructions were timing insensitive, then the ability to use timing side channels on things like software implemented cryptographic algorithms became a, um, a noticeable problem. And interestingly, I said, well, this collection of really ordinary instructions like add, subtract, shift, surely they're all timing insensitive in our processors. <laughs> uh, all the, the microarchitects came back and said, oh no, 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 we do all sorts of weird optimizations. Please give us control bits that allow you to denote which pieces of code need to be timing insensitive and which ones are not. And it's it showed, and one of the things, one of the lessons I've learned over the years is that um, software people massively underestimate the complexity of modern hardware and the amount that it is not just following the simple five-stage pipeline that we all learned from Henson Patterson in the early 90s. Completely different things. They do wacky, wacky stuff. And actually, again, when we come on to Spectre, we'll talk about that again. And there was a discussion earlier about Trust Zone and putting in multiple, um, having multiple trusted execution environments. Uh, whoever was doing that, we're actually adding virtualization support onto the secure side to make that much easier uh, as part of version 8.4. And there's more stuff going on. Um, landing pads were talked about a bit earlier. Uh, and that's there to, com um, to complement the point of authentication. The idea of a landing pad is the idea that your functions would be annotated where these are the only things I can do indirect branches to or indirect calls to, because the whole point of things like return-oriented programming is you branch into convenient for you, the hacker's uh, place into the code. Um, and most normal situations shouldn't be able to do that. So if you can actually say these are the legal entry points, then you can um, secure code a great deal more. It, authentic it uh, complements the point of authentication quite nicely. We were looking at um, there's some really good work by Costia Serebiani um, out of Google. Um, he's been doing a whole bunch of work on this thing, address sanitizer. And it, that's really interesting. What it's looking for is its um, runtime ways of discovering buffer overflow and use after free vulnerabilities. Um, and what we reckon, we've been working with Google guys to try and identify hardware ways of accelerating that because we're faced with a world today where there are literally millions of applications which are crawling with vulnerabilities that haven't yet been exploited. Heartbeat has given us an example of something really embarrassing that had been in code forever and, in, and it should have been found, but nobody ever got around to doing it. Um, the idea here is, could you just crowdsource the debugging of all of the world's applications by, if, if the cost of running an address sanitizer was sufficiently cheap, every time your, um, for, you run an application, if it hits a buffer overflow, if it hits a use after free, it will just report that information back and allow the world to get cleaned up. Now, if you've got billions of people using apps in all of the time, then the amount of information there to it, remove all of these exploits, so all of these vulnerabilities before they become exploits, you clean it up. And it's really interesting. I think this is a really powerful technique just to improve the world software. It's not a mitigation technique. It's not got anything like the power of Cherry. Now, to be absolutely clear, I love where Cherry's going. I think it got some really fantastic possibilities, but it's going to take quite a long time to deploy, and we need to do something in the shorter term. But short term is five years, long term to deploy is ten years. Practically, the pressing. Um, so cleaning up all of this code, finding the vulnerabilities before they become exploits is, is really key. Um, and there's an awful lot that can be done there. And we believe that all of these ideas are complementary to something like Cherry, because we've been doing a lot of work, as Simon alluded to, um, with the university on the Cherry concept. And we believe that in the longer term, 
that is almost certainly the way to, to go because it's about time the hardware guy stepped up and said, we need something that will really properly um, differentiate between pointers and data different and essentially set the limits on how you can access memory. And then we've got in a whole bunch of mitigation spectrum meltdown, which we'll come on to. But it's an arms race. Um, every time I go to a security conference, and every time I go to um, or I read reports of what's going on in things like black hat conferences, there are more and more cunning ways of exploiting code. Um, <laughs> I, I'm old enough, I've been in this industry far too long, but I'm old enough to remember when we thought, hey, execute never, that's going to be great. That will stop people doing attacks. And then somebody came up with a return to libc, and then they came up with a return oriented programming, jump oriented programming, and everything else oriented programming. Uh, and the mitigations can be added in hardware software, but they all tend to be broken quickly. And when you spend four years to deploy it and it gets broken in one week, that's really depressing. More research into these sort of techniques is needed. Um, and any Techniques, the techniques that are needed for the 8.x program are things that can be deployed relatively easily into existing code bases. Something as radical or as, despite the fact that Simon and Robert's work on Cherry is remarkably complete for a piece of research, an awful lot of proof of concept, is still a lot of work to take that towards industrial deployment. If only partly to get people over the sticker shock, having just gone from 32-bit pointers to 64-bit pointers, the sticker shock of 128-bit pointers is freaking some people out. We've got more to prove on that, but there's also more to prove in how it fits into existing code when there are billions of lines of code that can't, you can't afford to break in the real industrial world because people want their phones to work. Then you need to have a very good deployment story that explains how this will provide benefits relatively quickly. Um, but, um, in the short term, what we look for are things that can be deployed quickly and easily, um, where quickly, as I say, is four to five years in terms of getting in the field, in terms of specifying it and proving that it provides sufficient benefit in software in about a year. In, in about a year, yeah. And as Simon alluded to, the fundamental problems of buffer overflow have been around for a long time and they're not being fixed anytime soon. Cherry is a great, uh, big, Big fix for it, what can we do in the shorter term? And use after free is, there are some ways that you can reason about uh, Cherry helping with use after free, but use after free is the second most common cause of uh, vulnerabilities and exploits in the world's code, and there's an awful lot of work to be done about that. Which is why some of the ideas I talked about before, about having um, not so much worrying about mitigating uh, the exploits, finding the vulnerabilities, and cleaning up the world's software is the first step to making the world a better place. And then there is, of course, the whole area of side channels. And a date that will go down in my mind for really quite a long time is the 1st of June 2017, because I got an email from a man called Jan Horn. Um, it actually came in to... This isn't a pointer. Um, the alias at the top, support at arm.com, easy one to remember. If anyone thinks they have a vulnerability on arm, that's a great email address to, to send it to. Uh, my team were notified within 24 hours of it coming in, and um, I put it there. It did have the full oh shit moment that went with that. There was, it didn't take very much reading of Jan's original report to go, you, you went through the, the denial of, ah, this is nothing to, oh my god. Um, we started to uh, triage exposure within four days and started working with the architecture partners and consulting on how on earth we could do something about it within nine uh, days. It then took a further six months to work out how to properly deploy that into the world software. And that's another interesting deployment challenge. We knew all the art, we knew roughly what we had to do after nine days. But it took until, well, it, was, it was meant to come out on the 8th of January or 3rd of January courtesy of um, some AMD shenanigans. It came out um, in a rather uncontrolled way and I was in a hotel in Luxembourg trying to brief our sales team in the middle of the night trying to explain what on earth is going on. Peter. Um, the Spectre was, was really, really interesting. I, actually, there's an interesting contrast with Spectre and Meltdown. Meltdown was found a little bit later. It was found three weeks later. Um, but the 
the spectre thing is actually reasonably fundamentally a change to the game. It is a different thing from what we have seen before. And I said a little bit at the start, um, as an architect, my job is, this is what the process is meant to do. Microarchitects, go and find the cleverest way you can to do that, because that's your job to do it. And effectively, speculation was entirely invisible at the architecture level, not entirely invisible. There are tiny little uh, places where you can see it. Um, not being able to access read sensitive memory locations, um, that there are rules associated with that. But it was really in the margins. In general, we basically said, fix up the hardware, experiment the, the hardware in any way you like. And the key goal, the key thing, the key invention in computer science in many ways for accelerating stuff is to put the stuff that you access frequently close to you. Use temporal and spatial locality uh, as much as possible. And the prize of getting things out of that memory that is hundreds of cycles away, close to you where it's three cycles away, is so big that it can, that guessing, I'll put that in there, I'll put that in there, I'll put that in there, is an enormous prize for the world's microarchitects. So they spend a lot of time speculating that that's going to be the thing I need, that's going to be the thing I need. And you actually look at the amount, and some of the techniques that are coming along, or were coming along, um, associated with uh, intelligent prefetches of, of linked lists and uh, data value prediction, which I'll come on to. Um, all of those introduce new ways in which this idea that your speculation paths now become a route to leading, leaking data. And particularly if you can influence the speculation path, there is a channel from low uh, privilege to higher privilege to get it to do something which will then leak information to lower privilege. That was truly terrifying. Um, and as I say, many of the cutting edge techniques that people were literally thinking, this generation, we're going to put in full scale value prediction because we need to do that to get the next step in performance. Um, those, those techniques are ones where the hardware guys have suddenly gone, oh my god, how am I going to cope with this in the world of speculation? And indeed, Linus Torvalds has been very publicly announcing that any implementation that was broken in a spectre type way because of value prediction, he regards as just being fundamentally broken. In other words, the software people have this assumption, many new software people, not, not a criticism, but there is an assumption about the way the processes work, which is really part of the, the model that we were all taught in Henderson Patterson with computer science. And in reality, um, he, the processes have gone long past that, and a lot of these speculative techniques mean that people haven't even started to reason about why speculation matters. And here's a really good example. Um, one of the, this is why data value speculation, data value prediction, is a real problem for spectra. I'm assuming most of you are aware of spectra, but the basic idea is there's an untrusted offset which gets passed up the kernel. The kernel then, um, in some way, sanitizes that. Having supposedly sanitizes it, it will then use that to access one array or one piece of data. And it, the result of that then gets passed on to an access to a second piece of data. And that second piece of data, because the address comes from the first piece of data loaded, will leave a footprint in the caches that disclose the value of that data or part of the value of that data. That's the principle. The classic way of exploiting it is the sanitization of the address is um, done by if offset is less, if untrusted offset is less than the limit, then go and use this thing. And of course, Spectre's whole mechanism was the, um, the hardware would speculate past that branch. It would go, well, I'm assuming that branch is not going to be taken. Um, or so it's great and they're going to go somewhere else. Uh, I'll assume the branch is not going to be taken and therefore I will do those loads. And the whole problem was you could then pass any old offset you like, it would then speculatively do the loads and reveal any data that you have selected. So it became a channel of a less privileged code to influence the speculative execution of a more privileged processor. 
And when it all became public, or the Linux lists all said, we'll strip out all of those conditional clauses, and if the, things, if the array I'm going to access is aligned to, to the N inside, what I can do is, hey, um, I take the off untrusted offset and add that with just a limit mask, and that will sanitize the address, and then I can go use it. No ifs, that's spectre free, fantastic. Except that it's not, because that will get transformed into this code. That's a load of the limit mask into a register. This then adds that with the value holding the untrusted offset, and you then use that for the two memory accesses. But because this load is likely to take some time, people doing value prediction go, you know what, I'm going to guess the value of that load and speculate past it. So I guess the value of that load, but you know what, I'll guess all less. Now I've got all less in there, that and is just no. And I'm taking the untrusted variable doing the loads and I'm back in Spectre Lab. Um, so all of a sudden, value prediction makes this possible. And what's really fun is we introduced this not very well named CSDB. Um, the, the history of why it's named that's not worth going into that I've got time. Um, but there's, it's like it's like a game we play in England of um, pin the tail of the donkey. Where do you put the CSDB in here to work out the right place to put it? And the answer is there. But if you put it there, which is between getting the limit mask back and doing the AND, nobody has said to the world that the hardware couldn't predict that X2 on the way into the AND. There's an assumption I make if I put the value in there. That what the barrier says is resolve all speculation when we go faster. Uh, if I put the barrier there, then I'm assuming the hardware prediction will be made by that load, not be made by that AND. And nobody in the world has said that's the only place you should do hardware prediction. The whole point is these new techniques like hardware prediction that are just starting to be used, nobody knows what the rules are, and therefore nobody knows how to put in the barriers, and nobody knows how to make their code safe. And so there's a whole bunch of research and education and teaching to try and formalize this, because we all know how to cope with um, branches, because we, we read about branches in Hennessy and Patterson back in the 90s when we were studying computer science. Those of you who are younger than that, when you did, whenever you did your computer science, didn't. but there's a lot of learning here. There's a lot of stuff that people don't know about. And I, I, I keep on saying I like Cherry. Cherry would be really interesting for this in the long term. If we'd had Cherry today, then some of the um, Spectre issues would have been mitigated, particularly the variant one one. I say that, assuming, of course, the bounds check was actually done and acted on at the time that you did the memory access using it. And if you think what meltdown was, which is you delay taking exceptions and speculate past the technical exceptions, it would have been perfectly possible for people to have used the Cherry architecture and still had meltdown spectre type problems. Uh, my view is, if you look at uh, spectre variant 2 and meltdown, those are I, I, get into, I'm not, I want a camera to be slightly careful. Those were choices made by microarchitects that were the right things to do at the time, given that no one knew about Spectre Meltdown, but in retrospect appear, appear to be the wrong decisions. And it's interesting that Intel very recently announced that their future hardware will be immune from uh, variants 2 and 3 of Spectre. Uh, but interestingly, Variant 1 is much more fundamental. And the reason it's much more fundamental is the basic pattern of the code is that. And if I took all of the world's code and looked for that simple pattern, I will find it millions and billions of times. And 99.7% of all statistics are made up. 99% of those situations will not actually be security problems, because this is only a problem when that validity check when X here is actually coming from something less trusted. And the hardware cannot know whether something came from less trusted, because a lot of the, the, the trust values are not even explicit to the hardware. If, if you go from JavaScript into, into your native code and application, you're not crossing any boundaries that the hardware knows about. So this code sequence is common as muck, and we kind of have three choices. So the hard, so the hardware people want to be an accelerator. You have to be able, because that, that if clause will take time to evaluate, 
they have to be able to speculate past that. Um, so we kind of have got three choices, and none of them are remotely attractive. But software has to either automatically be able to identify those errant cases, and the software people tell me that's hard because of the reasons I talked about. The vast majority of the time, you have to almost know something about the data that you're working with. Is it a trustworthy thing? We haven't got the language to start reasoning. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, the hardware needs to, to stop leaking information by allocating things into the cache, and I'll come on to that because there's some challenges there. Or we go back to the 1990s and don't do speculation. Not a very powerful thing. And, and my second last slide, uh, there's an invention needed. Um, and quite interestingly, since the spectre thing broke, I've had this idea um, proposed to me on at least four occasions, the idea of a side-channel free cache instruction. By side-channel, I mean timing side-channel. Um, this idea of a speculation buffer. Well, what you would do is, while the thing is speculative, I'll bring it into this buffer, and if it turns out that's, that's incorrect, I can throw it away. Hey, spectre solved. Except that in real world, we have coherent caches. So everything that moves data around means fingerprints in other caches. The amount of data movement going on on modern processors as a result of speculation is very high. And the idea that you could bring in the speculation and unwind it in a way that made it impossible to see a fingerprint of it, really, really hard. And if anyone wants a hugely award-winning microarchitectural prize, anyone that can solve that problem will do us a tremendous favor. So, so I want to spend a bit of time on that just to give an idea of my life as an industrialist trying to apply some of the research that's going on, some of the technical challenges that we're seeing. Um, I love that I've only we've only recently, I'm to be a bit late on this, discovered RISE. I think that the charter of having people doing research into um, hardware techniques for security, vital. I think security is, I say this many times, it is the challenge um, that computing needs to meet to um, really reach its potential going forward. I think the biggest block to computing doing what all the vision we say it's going to be is the security challenge. And I don't think people fully grasp that. The moment security is really difficult to say. Um, but it needs to be deployable security. The deployment challenges are frequently underestimated. Simon did a fantastic presentation with Cherry of showing what looks like it's ready to go technology. Um, without going into too many details, we spent a lot of time trying to work out what it will take to take into industry, and it's still going to take a long time to hit the market. And that's despite we're putting in a lot of effort as well. Um, doesn't mean to say we're not going to try, but it takes a long time. So small scale things are great. Microarchitectural things you can't see the programmer really good. The other thing, I, I use the phrase set a hacker to, to catch a hacker. Um, hardware people are continually surprised at the sophistication of attacks. Um, one of the best things we got, Google Project Zero, their paper, their paper that published Spectre, has a reverse analysis of uh, Intel's branch predictor. It did that in order to do variant two. And the amount of information they were able to extract about how the branch predictor really went scared the living daylights out of all of the microarchitects I know. Because they all go, I'll never work out how the branch predictor really works, it doesn't matter. Oh look, here's, here's one guy in Switzerland managing to do it relatively easily. And what's really interesting is the hardware guys are forever inventing partial solutions. I gave the example a little bit earlier of the speculation buffer, but there were tons of them. Um, we, we, we pour our, our souls into coming up with, with a, a solution that we think is there, and four years later it comes out, and two weeks after that it's broken. It's not a good return on investment. So, actually, research that proves the robustness of the proposal, nothing that can work with industry uh, to do it. One of the comments that was made, just a final comment, um, was that industry and academia need to work together um, better in order to solve these challenges. And part of the reason I'm here is to really reinforce that message from the industrial side. I really want to work with the researchers in this area 
come up with deployable solutions to what I regard as the biggest problems going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry that this session overran by quite a bit, but I, I thought it was such a good talk and I didn't want to interrupt. Maybe we have time for a very quick question or rather a quick answer if somebody has one that they want to pose. Okay, quickly, yes. First uh, talk, uh, I was, I just want to come up, like, what was saying in the conclusion, uh, like, research and help uh, in producing good architectures. Do you think opening up the architecture from the production of that or something like RISC-V? Why did I see the word RISC-V coming? I, um, interesting challenge, try and work out how people have managed uh, spectrum with the risk five world, but that's another story. Um, I think there's a, a place for the architecture that people work on to prove things, and the architecture things get deployed on don't necessarily do the same thing. The cherry work that's being done at the moment is on um, MIPS, and despite ARM's historical enmity towards MIPS, um, perfectly happy with that, and actually it allows us to, and this is a pun, cherry pick the features that they put in <laughs> if we want to take them into the architecture. To a certain extent, I really like RISC-V as a fantastic playground for people to go and research techniques because you get to play with, maybe this will work, and academics like to sort of follow little tendrils of different ideas, and you have lots of those things running without having to worry about how do I reconcile this into a commercial architecture. So actually I'm a big fan of people using RISC-V in academia to try out some of these ideas, and then to work with the industrial people to work out how to do it, because they actually have different constraints. Um,